Colin Prendeville from Lancaster, who will speak on adopting the circle method for colorings. Please. Great. Well, thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak today. And, and thank you to Mel for continuing to organize such a fantastic series of, um, of, of talks every year. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, the circle method, the high little circle method from analytic number theory, and adapting it to tackle problems in Ramsey theory, in arithmetic Ramsey theory. So let me give you a flavor. There are problems in Ramsey theory I'm interested in. So here's a result from, of Scherf from the early 20th century. And we're interested in equations robust in part, under partition. So which equations can you not destroy their solution set through partitions? So let me um, go into details. If we color the positive integers with finitely many colors, um, Scherf's theorem says there are three positive integers, x, y, and z. They've all got the same color and they solve this equation, x plus y equals z. Okay, so you can't destroy solutions to this equation through finite partitions. One of the parts of the partition has to contain a solution to the equation. So that's a nice result, but what's special about this equation? Is there anything special about it? So we give um, equations which possess this property uh, the name partition regular. And Rado in the 30s characterized which linear um, forms have this partition regularity property. And essentially, if you, if you fix your coefficients, integer coefficients, the resulting linear equation is partition regular if and only if some subset of these coefficients sums to zero. So that takes out a sort of complicated combinatorial property where there are lots of different colorings of the positive integers, finite colorings, and it reduces it to a simple problem in algebra which a computer could solve. Okay, so that's the end of the story for, for linear equations in some sense. Um, but with Sam Chow and Sophia Lindquist, we, we generalize this to higher degree diagonal equations. So now I take my um, diagonal form of degree K, um, I fix the coefficients C1 up to CS, and when is this diagonal form of degree K partition regular? Well, it's partition regular if and only if the same algebraic characterization holds some subset of the coefficient sums to zero. But there's a caveat, and that's that we need the number of variables to be sufficiently large in terms of the degree. And practitioners of the circle method will be very familiar with this kind of caveat. And one of the reasons you need this caveat is, you know, the Fermat equation, the Fermat cubic, has no monochromatic solutions because it's got no solutions. And what can we get away with in terms of the number of variables? Well, for quadratic, Diagonal quadratic forms, our methods need at least five variables. For diagonal cubic forms, we need around, we need at least eight, eight variables. And for general degree K, we need around K log K variables because this is precisely what's needed um, for the best results in the circle method at the moment to just solve this equation or count solutions actually for this equation or give a lower bound of the expected order of magnitude, for the number of solutions to this equation. Okay. So maybe that's the end of the story, or maybe it's not, because sometimes when you want to solve these equations monochromatically, you can cheat, you can get away with um, not working hard. So one way you can cheat is, here's an equation. It's not clear whether it's partition regular or not. Turns out it's not partition regular, but you can always generate a monochromatic solution. So in, in, under my original definition, it is partition regular, um, by cheating, by just using this um, annoying solution 222. So maybe you need to modify your notion of partition regularity to account for these um, finite set of bad solutions. But actually that's not enough. The equation of three-term progressions um, has infinitely many um, boring solutions, x, 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 okay? So again, maybe you need to change your definition of non-trivial to avoid some, some subspace. Um, so to avoid this di these diagonal solutions, which aren't very interesting, and which are always monochromatic, maybe we need to avoid the diagonal subspace. And just to say that these diagonal solutions are um, sparse in the set of all possible solutions. So the number of diagonal solutions in this interval one up to n is linear in the length of the interval, whereas the number of solutions to your equation, the number of three-term progressions is, is quadratic in the length of the interval. Okay, so maybe, 
the right notion of non-trivial or the right notion of partition regularity accounts for these diagonal for this diagonal subspace. But still, that's not enough. Here's an equation in four variables. It is partition regular, but you can generate monochromatic solutions to this equation by solving a, an equation in three variables by setting y equal to z. And maybe you regard these solutions as cheating when you're trying to solve this equation. So maybe the new notion of non-trivial should be avoiding two of the variables coinciding. Is that a better notion of partition regularity? And just to say that these solutions to this three variable equation are quadratic in the length of the interval and the four variable equation number of solutions is cubic in the length of the interval so that these trivial solutions are again sparse. So the basic question I want to talk about today is, um, how do we guarantee generic monochromatic solutions? Okay. And I'm going to address this by uh, counting the number of monochromatic solutions. So this is a combinatorial way of answering this question. Um, and as one might talk about uh, Zariski dense subsets and this kind of thing, and we're going to avoid that kind of soft answer. So Frankel, Graham, and Ruddle answered this question for linear equations. Um, if your linear form satisfies Rado's criterion, so that's necessary to ensure there is at least one uh, monochromatic solution, so it's a partition regular equation, then the number of monochromatic solutions in your interval one up to n is some implicit constant, depending on the number of colors, times n to the s minus one. And n to the s minus one is, is an upper bound on the number of solutions to this equation in an interval. So the catchphrase is a positive proportion of solutions to this equation in the interval are monochromatic under any finite coloring. Um, I've hidden some dependence here. There's dependence on the coefficients and the number of variables. And there's also, this only works when the length of the interval is sufficiently large in terms of the number of colors and the coefficients. But just to be able to pass these things for the first time, let's forget about all that dependence. Okay. So you've seen this result for linear equations, then you ask about higher degree diagonal equations. So I can say something. Um, let's look at diagonal quadratic forms. And again, in any R coloring, in any finite coloring, the number of monochromatic solutions to this equation, provided there's at least one monochromatic solution. Um, I'm sorry, my internet is a little bit slow. The number of monochromatic solutions is a positive proportion of the total number in the interval. Um, so we've got n to the s minus two here instead of n to the s minus one. And that's because the number of um, solutions to this equation in the interval is of the order n to the s minus two at most. You can prove that using the highly little circle method. There's probably more elementary ways of proving that. So again, the catchphrase is a positive proportion of solutions are monochromatic provided your equation satisfies Rado's criteria, provided there's at least one monochromatic solution. Okay, so what goes into proving these results? Well, um, I use the hardy littlewood circle method, which is sort of a cornerstone of analytic number theory. Um, discrete restriction estimates, one might view that as a part of harmonic analysis. I mean, practitioners of the circle method would see these two things as essentially the same. Um, this is just language and a viewpoint. We use a transference principle from additive combinatorics, which allows you to deduce results about dense sets of integers and deduce results about sparse sets of integers from dense sets of integers. So this goes back to um, Ben Green's work on Ross theorem and the primes, where you can say stuff about dense sets of primes and using results. And again, practitioners in additive and combinatorics will, will view, um, sorry, my internet connection is not very good. Let me see if I can do it. Um, hmm. Can't prove it. Do I want to risk trying to improve it? Let me take a pause. Did that work? Look, not so well. Okay, let's see if that works a little bit better. Okay, 
So yeah, transference principle and arithmetic regularity are two sides of the same coin, essentially. They're basically the same thing. Um, so what else can you prove? If you've got um, four sledgehammers from analytic number theory and additive combinatorics, you should be able to um, crack a few more nuts with those four sledgehammers. And here's something one can probably prove. I've not proved it. Uh, I'd encourage you, those of you who want to get to grips with these ideas to, to have a go. But I think it should follow. Um, basically the same thing. If you want to solve this higher degree equation, degree K, you want to solve it monochromatically. Um, the number of such monochromatic solutions should be a positive proportion of the total number in the interval. Okay. And the number of variables you need here will be around the best you can hope for according to the records in the circle method. Okay, so these methods are robust and, and they're actually robust enough to, to look at different sorts of equations. We can look at inhomogeneous equations. So what do I mean by an inhomogeneous equation? Well, here's an inhomogeneous equation where we've got um, some linear terms and some quadratic terms. And it's a result of Vitaly Bergelson from the 80s that this is partition regular. But Bergelson proved this using um, a Goddick theory. One can probably get away with um, a soft version of harmonic analysis if you want to prove this. Um, but there's certainly no counting result, um, no lower bound on the number of monochromatic solutions. Um, so um, I obtained a counting version of, of this result, sorry, for the the dates here, I had to edit my slide at the last minute. So in any finite R coloring of this interval of integers, how many monochromatic solutions do you have to this X minus Y equals Z squared? Well, there's um, around N to the, at least N to the three divided by two to the R. So when you first see this, it looks like an odd lower bound, or quite a weak lower bound. One of the reasons it's weak is the number of solutions to this equation in the interval is n to the three over two of order. So certainly we don't have a positive proportion of um, solutions being monochromatic, at least according to this result. And that's in fact, um, not just an artifact of, of the methods, it's, it's, it's the truth, because there is an arc coloring of this interval, of an interval, with at most this many monochromatic solutions to, to the equation. So strange things happen for inhomogeneous equations. So here's the coloring. You take your first color class, you take the upper endpoint to be the uh, largest element of your interval and the lower endpoint to be the square root of the upper endpoint. Now, because of um, some real considerations with this equation, it's not hard to show there's no solution to this equation in, in intervals where the lower endpoint is the square root of the upper endpoint. So let's repeat this. Our next interval, the lower endpoint is the square root of the upper endpoint. And we carry on doing that. There's no solutions in any of these intervals. But when we get to the rth color class, if we're only allowed to use r colors, for the last color class, we can't go down to the square root of the upper endpoint. We've got to mop up all the remaining integers. So this is the color class where we generate our monochromatic solutions. How many monochromatic solutions are there in this interval, well, there's the length of the interval to the power of three over two, and that's this number on order of magnitude. Okay. So this is in some sense, the right shape of bound. But what's special about this Bergelson equation, X minus Y equals Z squared? Well, let's try and generalize what that equation looks like. It looks like a linear form equal to a diag diagonal quadratic form where the variables x and y are disjoint. So when are equations of this type partition regular? If we fix our coefficients, a's and b's, non-zero integers, when is an inhomogeneous equation of this form partition regular? Well, we've got some necessary conditions. So in work of Dinasso and Luperi Baglini, um, basically, if this equation is partition regular, then either the left-hand side satisfies Rado's criterion, some subset of the coefficient sums to zero, or the right-hand side satisfies Rado's criterion. And um, you can prove this using some kind of local argument, come up with a, a, a p-adic coloring or 
something like that. Um, I think these authors use the language of ultra filters, but it's basically some local, local coloring. Once you've seen this, you ask, is this sufficient? And I can sort of answer that. I can say, this is the right characterization of when this equation is partition regular, and um, provided the equation doesn't look like this. And I can't handle equations of this form. It's, a real, it's really just an artifact of the methods I employ. And um, what do I mean by equations which look like this? I mean, an equation where there are three quadratic terms whose coefficients don't sum to zero, and then there's one linear term. So all other equations of this type, um, this is the right characterization of partition regularity. Um, evidence towards this being partition regular, if you assume a famous conjecture of Hyman, which says that you can always find monochromatic configurations of the form x, y, x plus y, x times y. Um, if you assume that conjecture, then this is partition regular, but that's a much harder conjecture than just showing that this is partition regular. But that's evidence towards the fact that this is just an artifact of the methods I employ and nothing to do with what the truth is. Okay. So I think that's all I want to say about um, results. Now I want to talk about um, some of the ideas which go into these proofs. So the, there's two ideas essentially. One is to make things asymmetric. So normally in Ramsey theory, you've got density results like Semmeredi's theorem, dense sets of integers contain K term progressions. And you've got coloring results like Van der Waarden's theorem, which says in any finite coloring of the positive integers, one of the color classes contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. And these density results are often a lot deeper than the coloring results. So it's, you can teach Van der Waarden's theorem to undergraduates. I probably wouldn't try that with Semmeredi's theorem. But in this situation, we're going to deduce the coloring results from a density result. So we're taking the long route round. So you can always deduce coloring results from density results, but now we're going and um, taking the hard road essentially to these coloring results by going through density results. So what do these density results look like? So they involve a bunch of dense sets, all of positive density, and that density is uniformly bounded below by some parameter delta. And I've also got a coloring, okay? But the coloring, you'll see in a minute why the coloring is at a different scale. It's, it's of a smaller interval. And the conclusion of my density coloring result is that one of these color classes, um, is really nice in that for any of these dense sets, provided my interval is sufficiently large in terms of all the lingering parameters, the number of solutions to my Bergelson equation is a positive proportion of, of what it should be in the interval, where the quadratic variable is weighted by the coloring and the other variables are weighted by the dense set. So some of the variables are being solved in the dense set, some of the variables are being solved in the color class, but this color class works for all of the dense sets. So why, what's special about the variables? So essentially I'm gonna weight the variables which sum to zero, whose coefficients sum to zero. They're gonna come from the dense set. So that's what we call a, maybe the translation invariant part of the equation. And the rest of the variables are going to come from my color. Okay, so it's sort of technical looking result. But the point is we've got both a bunch of dense sets and a coloring. We're counting solutions to our equation where we're weighting different variables by different combinatorial weights. Um, there's nothing special about this Bergelson equation. You can, you, know, you can put essentially whatever you want on the right-hand side of this equation. Here, you could have a sum of three squares, but on the left-hand side, the dense variables always weight something a linear form whose coefficients sum to zero. So you can generalize this as far as you want. How do you prove it? You can prove it using the arithmetic regularity lemma. But once you've got this, you can um, upgrade it to change these linear variables to variables coming from sparse sets. And this is via the transference principle. So you can change these dense variables to um, squares. So this second result I've written down here is the same as the first result, 
all I've done is I've changed these linear variables to square variables. And you can see this is now resembling uh, a diagonal quadric in five variables, which is partition regular. Okay. Uh, what do I want to say about that? Oh, the other thing I want to say is I've changed the scales at which my colouring and dense sets are working, just to make sure I'm counting everything up to the right scale. Okay, so this is nice. We're sort of getting to the point where we can establish partition regularity of this diagonal quadric. What else do we need to do? We need to get the colouring involved somehow. Here's the, I'm just repeating this, this density plus colouring result here, where I'm counting some variables weighted by dense sets, some of the variables weighted by color class. And we want to say that um, there are lots of monochromatic solutions to this equation, lots of solutions where all of the variables are weighted by the same color class. So we'd essentially like to take these sets to be the color classes, the AIs to be the CJs. And then this special color class, which works for all of the dense sets, well, one of these dense sets will be CJ itself. So we can set AI to be CJ, and we've got this nice lower bound. We've counted monochromatic solutions in CJ. But there's a problem with that, and that's that some of, not all of these CJ are dense. Okay, so think of um, maybe one of your color classes is the, is the powers of two. And you're in trouble if this CJ that's spat out by um, this theorem is the powers of two. Because then, um, yeah, you don't have this assumption that all of your color classes are dense. But you can see that that's, that won't happen because this result automatically shows that whatever CJ is, it's mildly dense. You can use some elementary counting arguments to show that if you've got this positive proportion of solutions um, weighted by CJ, then CJ has to be quite dense. Okay, so how do we solve this? Well, let's maybe threshold and not take these dense sets to be all of the color classes, but just those color classes which are sufficiently dense. So our density parameter might be one over R. Does that work? Again, it doesn't quite work because this implicit factor here, um, it takes your density parameter, it puts it through some machine and outputs a weaker um, number here. So maybe this is, dependence here is sort of exponential in the density. So then you use your counting arguments to, to deduce that this CJ is, a, is mildly dense, but maybe it's um, much less dense than this. So what do I mean by that? Imagine that the CJ that works for this theorem, you do your counting arguments and you find that if this holds, the implicit constant here means that CJ is, is, is mildly dense in terms of R and and delta, but it's certainly not this dense. Okay, so again, we can't take, we don't know that the CJ output by the theorem is equal to one of our original dense sets, which have density one over R, because all we know from this, this counting lower bound is that CJ is mildly dense. So again, CJ might not be an AI. We can't get this AI to equal CJ, the, C, the special CJ we want. So the cleaving strategy is to find some density, which depends on the number of colors, so that all color classes are either very dense or very sparse. So what does the picture look like? Here we've got our color classes, some very dense color classes, mildly dense color classes, asymptotically um, sparse color classes. We throw down a density, and then we throw down and the next density, which it comes about from this implicit constant here. And we continue iterating, use this as our original density, and, and we've got some function of this density here. And we throw down these densities. And what we're looking for is um, a situation in, where, in which no color class lies between the sparse parameter and the dense parameter. And this um, doesn't work here because we've got a color class lying between a sparse parameter and a dense parameter, but here there's a gap. So all color classes are either this dense, that's these two, or they're this sparse, that's all of these. Okay, so then your CJ that's output from this um, theorem, you know it lies here, it's mildly dense, 
But in fact, it has to be very dense because there are no intermediate um, color classes. So in fact, the CJ is, a, is one of the very dense color classes you started with. And that's the, the sort of cleaving idea. And that's all I wanted to talk about today. Oh, thank you very much. Are there uh, questions for Sean? If not, then uh, I thank our speaker again. And our next talk is in uh, four minutes. Thank you.